Now this talk is more related with uh, the structural characterization and the morphology of the material. So how many of you have used the XRD or the SEM for your, so now there are many hands I see. So that is what we want that okay it is very good that you prepare material and after you, that you do the XRD and SEM and some other uh, that kind of basic characterization. But after that what we insist you that is what we want to say and again we will emphasize this point tomorrow also. We want you to go ahead and try to make some device out of these materials. And when you make some device out of this material then obviously you have to do the electrical characterization, you have to do more optical characterization and all that because ultimately the objective uh, should be to uh, use uh, your research work for making devices and then try to look where these devices can be used and that way go ahead and try to basically synchronize your research effort along the direction of the national theme and the national goals that we have to basically to uh, carry out the research who the end point it should be more kind of societal benefit. So that should be the objective so that we keep on emphasizing and we will keep on emphasizing tomorrow also in our interaction. So that is what we want to do. But anyway, so I will talk a little bit more detail about this XRD and the SEM and since you are using it perhaps you can have more queries. So maybe we are not able to answer everything today. So tomorrow also we have the interaction meeting. So there also we will talk more detail about this. So first I will start talking about this X-ray diffraction facility. So this photograph is the shown here is the XRD tools that we have here in a nanoscale research facility that is Ultima uh, is the name of the model. So why we require the X-ray diffraction? So that is the one of the basic question that we will try to answer you. Uh, you see uh, we want to prepare some materials but at the end we want to be sure that uh, we really prepare the material that we wanted to prepare. And apart from that we wanted to know that the material that we have prepared is, re is really a single phase material. What I mean by single phase material? For example, I want to make a copper indium selenite and it is not that along with the copper indium selenites I am also making with some part copper oxide, some part indium oxide and all that. So that is what we want to be sure that the material that we have prepared is really have only copper indium selenite nothing else. So that kind of things we want to know. So, so that is why we want to do this uh, X-ray diffraction characterization and how the X-ray diffraction characterization can help you that is what we will tell. So and apart from that I mean in the beginning also Professor Wansi was also talking that when you make a material the material can be in a form a single crystalline form, it could be polycrystalline and it could be amorphous also. So that is another thing we can test when we use the XRD facility. So that is what we will go one by one. So basically we want to make a structural characterization that is what we want to do. So when we say single crystal and all of you must have studied in your masters course and also in graduate course, when we say single crystal what I mean by single crystal. So whenever a solid is formed basically in solid all the atoms are arranged in some way or other. So in single crystal form uh, the atoms are arranged in a very uh, systematic way and the process is repeated over, over and over. So you get a very good periodicity over a very long range. This is how we define. And when you have a material in which uh, you have a uh, ordering of only for a small reason and then there is again a ordering for a small reason but in between there is a some kind of disturbance in the ordering. So that is what we call this polycrystal. Now the polycrystal is basically if we, if we say very uh, uh, broadly we say polycrystal is nothing but collection of many single crystals together in a form. And this unit where you get this kind of ordering it could be of the length of millimeter, it could be length of uh, 100 nanometer, it could be 10 nanometer. So depending upon how and uh, how uh, you are preparing this material. Okay. So that is what happen even a polycrystalline material you can have a reason which is like a single crystal of a 1 millimeter size, it is possible. 
and apart from that you have a amorphous material, amorphous material as the name uh, tells that there is no ordering at all. So, you get no crystallinity at all. So, that is another way. So, basically uh, sometimes the material occur naturally uh, amorphous, but uh, but it is very difficult that the material really gets a, in a amorphous form. So, you have to do lot of efforts also to make a single crystal and also lot of efforts to make it amorphous one. Because in single crystal you want perfect ordering, but at the same time in amorphous you want no ordering at all. Okay. So, for both things uh, special efforts are required, but most of the material that we see in our day to day life and normally we make it is most of them are a polycrystalline. So, how we can uh, do this thing, but before going ahead just give you a very briefly and very quickly uh, the basic thing about this uh, uh, crystallinity of the material and in what uh, crystalline form or what is the structure in which the material can occur. So, basically uh, if we have any material we always uh, in a single crystal material or in polycrystal also we always define a unit cell. And unit cell means that you go and find out a very minimum uh, area or the dimension of this one. And if you take that one you start repeating this hypothetically then you can construct the whole material so that is the idea. So, so, here I have shown one picture where this unit cell has a parameter a, b and c and also this alpha, beta and gamma uh, different angles are there with x, y and z direction. So, depending upon uh, what are these values a, b, c and what are the alpha, beta, gamma materials can have a different crystal structures. Okay. So, typically uh, in the literature if you see that there are only 14 Bravis lattice are possible whatever the combination and permutation you do. And knowledge of this thing is very important because when you do the XRD uh, studies then your material is going to form in either of these one. So, if you have the some of the basic understanding of this thing then you can really identify what kind of material you have made. So, I will not go in much detail of this kind of discussion here because these things are available in the textbook also you go to Ketel or any other solid state physics book you can get much more detail of this. But here I just wanted to tell you that uh, depending upon what are these uh, lattice parameter a1, a2, a3 and the value of alpha, beta and gamma this angle they can have a different form triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic. So, all these are the structures are possible in this uh, different type of material. And among them also there are different one for example, in orthorhombic you can have a base centered or you can have a body centered and you have a face centered. So, so again I, as I was saying that why the understanding of this thing is a little bit is a very important because when you see the x-ray diffraction where the peak is coming and what is the intensity of the peak these all things really depends upon the, the way these atoms are arranged in a unit cell. Okay. So, so I will just quickly go through it and then there is another one whenever you see this x-ray diffraction uh, you see that in peak there are some three numbers are written we call it HKL that is what is known as Miller indices. So, you also need to have a knowledge of this Miller indices because they are the basically the uh, reciprocal lattice kind of thing. So, few example I have given here. So, I will share these slides with you so you can go through in more details. For example, this plane which is shown here here in the in this shaded region shown the plane here uh, which is cutting on the x axis as 1 y and z at uh, so uh, is not cutting at all. So, the way the Miller indices are calculated basically they find out what is the intercept point. So, x it is coming let us say at 1 and y as z is not cutting it is a parallel plane. So, y and z it will be 0 infinity infinity. So, we take the reciprocal of these number. So, we get 1 0 0. So, 1 0 0 will be the Miller indices of these planes. Our other examples are also there. Uh, for example, this triangle which is formed here uh, which is cutting x, y and z axis at 3, 2 and 2. So, here, here again I take the inverse of the 2. So, the Miller indices for this plane will be 2, 3, 3. Okay. So, that way if you see any number 1, 0, 0 or 1, 1, 1 you know what plane it is corresponding to. So, that will provide you some idea of the x-ray diffraction peak. So, so, you have several example I have tried to give that how you can find out if the different planes are there, what are their Miller indices. So, that will provide you some idea that if you in your XRD peak 
you see only uh, only one peak is coming for example let's say 100 then you can very well say that since only one peak is coming it's all the planes are along the direction have a 100 kind of things okay so that's a basically a signature of a single crystal okay so x ray diffraction when x ray diffraction comes in so basically in x ray diffractometer uh, in the instrument you have a x ray source and then you have your specimen and then you have some detector so these three components are there and the samples you keep on some stage uh, some stage you keep your sample and there are different way if you have a bulk sample uh, powder form or you have a thin film sample then the different way of mounting is there that is a more detail maybe tomorrow when you will visit to the uh, facility then you will see this part more. Uh, but here just to uh, uh, make you a little bit aware that it is all based on this uh, what we call as Brog law uh, which basically tells that uh, this x-ray comes here and then uh, with this plane these are the crystals arranged so they will form a plane. So, here comes the role whatever we were saying in the Miller indices 100211. So, these are basically planes are there and from these planes these x-rays are uh, reflected back and then they interfere and they form this peak. So, that is what they do. So, here uh, if you see this expression a little bit then you will get an idea lambda is this wavelength of the x-ray and theta is this angle incident angle and d is the one which is uh, the uh, the spacing between these planes and this spacing between the plane is related with your a b c the lattice constant ok. So, so, so this is how it is correlated if you have a one material for which let us say cubic uh, structure is there. So, from there uh, you will get a particular value of d because of the because a b c both are same and from that you can find out at what angle the peaks will appear. So, theoretically one can work out and nowadays there are many programs also comes which tells you that how these kind of things can be calculated. So, x-ray as uh, now you see here that you require only one wavelength lambda. How the x-rays are generated? So, for generating x-ray they have this target here and the target this electrons are uh, thermally generated then they are accelerated electron go and fall on this target and when they collide with the target then they generate uh, this x-ray radiations. So, so there are two types of x-ray comes in you must have studied in your graduation course also what we call as soft, uh, soft ray and hard ray. So, typically you get a spectra something like this there is a continuous one uh, which is basically soft x-ray and then there, uh, there is a uh, uh, some kind of discrete x-ray also. A continuous x-ray and then there is a discrete line and discrete x uh, line basically correspond to the uh, the structure uh, the uh, what kind of uh, materials you are using is a copper is a different one and for uh, molybdenum it is a different one. So, basically for x-ray diffraction study we use one of these lines ok k alpha line we use rest of the radiation we just cut it out. So, this how we do that when the electron beam falls lot of radiation x-ray start coming we get rid of all the continuous x-ray we pick up only one peak uh, one discrete uh, wavelength and then we use that discrete length wavelength for uh, the, our experiments. So, we use uh, typically for the one that we are using here we use the nickel filter and because of the using of the nickel filter all these radiations are eliminated and we get just these lines k alpha 1 and k beta line to see this thing. And now we know very precisely what is the wavelength of the k lambda. So, we have the lambda value and from there we calculate the xrt. So, now I will just quickly show you this thing this, this is the instrument looks like uh, this uh, here is this x-ray generator and here we keep our sample and here is a detector which we keep on moving for recording the uh, value of the reflected x-ray at different value of theta. So, typically we get the x-ray diffraction peaks whenever you see this one you get these peaks something like this at different value of theta you get these peaks. Now, the question comes that how you will characterize this peak. So, that is one of the very important thing but that is how you identify your material. So, there are several ways you can do that uh, first quick way is that if you must be having some idea for example, suppose you are making zirconium oxide 
okay and you make this material like take the powder and then you get this kind of peak so so far you want to be sure that whether this peak belong to zirconium oxide or not so there are jcps data are available okay so you take that data and from that data it's given at what value of theta the peak will come okay then you start investigating your thing at what value of theta your peak is coming try to match the two if there is a good matching then you are very sure that some zirconium oxide is present now if suppose there is some extra peaks are also there then you have a trouble now what what these peaks are how you will find out then you have to speculate that from where this peak can come what could be the possible impurity which could be present so if say zirconium oxide is very simple uh, the impurity could come that when you are you are trying to make a zirconium oxide you would have purchased the zirconium powder from somewhere and in that process itself the with, along with the powder some impurity would have come so you go and check the label that how pure zirconium uh, powder you have purchased 99.999 or 95.95% or what it is so from there the impurity could come otherwise what happens if suppose you are making i was giving example of copper zinc uh, selenide let's say so there you can form copper oxide also you can form zinc oxide also then you start taking the data of these uh, uh, materials also and then try to match whether your uh, uh, that peak correspond to that copper oxide or zinc oxide also that way you can eliminate this thing okay so that's the first thing you will do then uh, Uh, you need not to stop at this point then there are certain programs are available and using that program if you are sure it's a zirconium oxide or zinc oxide whatever the material is then it's possible to basically uh, to find out what could be the lattice constant of this okay so with zinc oxide we know this is hexagonal structure so you take the hexagonal structure try to fit with that program and you can uh, obtain the what could be the lattice parameter of this thing and there is a ritwelt fitting also so you use a ritwelt fitting that's a more advanced thing and using that ritwelt fitting you can even find out much more detail of this thing that what are the lattice parameter what are the angles what are the bond length all these kind of parameters you can calculate so this is one thing so basically uh, uh, in xrd what you see uh, you can do the phase analysis phase analysis means that you can find out which material in how much percentage it is present that you can find out and then there is another important thing you can also find out the stress if you are making a thin film of the material or the nano structure of the material when you make a material the material could have some strain or stress so that also you can find out from this xrd and also you can find out the particle size so this is another information you can extract from your xrd study so i will just show you these photographs which are little bit busy but i can explain you that if uh, the uh, there is a, a formula which we call it sharer parameter uh, sharer formula which basically correlate the crystallite size with the uh, with the theta angle and uh, the so uh, and this uh, where is this uh, uh, you get a also the half width half width uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, fwhm full width half maxima so if it's a single crystal material then this width will be very small and if it's a polycrystalline material that width will be large so by calculating from this width and the delta theta and all that you can find out what is the size of your material crystal so again don't confuse this this could this is not a particle size this is a crystallite size so many times when people do the sem study or the tm study then they get a different result than what they get from xrd and this is a very standard question in most of the uh, viva they ask that from xrd you have find out uh, and that's telling 20 nanometer but your sem is telling it's a 1 micron so why these two things are different so one is a particle size another is a crystallite size so the difference comes in and if you really make a very nano materials and use the tm things and all that so there these two number can match also the another picture is shown here where the strain things are shown that if the filth films are grown and there is a shift in the peak so the shift of the peak can also tell you that what kind of strain is there uniform strain or non uniform strain also these can be find out tails can be find out from xrd but actually when you do the experiment uh, 
uh, you get much more detailed information. And in the last uh, slide I just want to show you that is what is known as Williamson Hall method. And in Williamson Hall method basically we try to fit all the XRD peaks and from that one I can find out in one go the strain and also the crystallite size that is also possible. I can discuss in more detail maybe tomorrow if you are more interested to know about this one. So that is all I wanted to tell about this XRD things. Uh, now yeah. Okay. So now I will just quickly and tell you about this SEM thing and then uh, we will be ready if you have any question to ask that. So this is the scanning electron microscope we have here in NRF but in IT we have many more uh, uh, scanning electron micro. This is the one which is the tabletop one model. So tomorrow when you will visit you will see this tabletop model of a scanning electron microscope. So basically the scanning electron microscope is used to see the surface topography. So if you prepare a film and you want to see that uh, the material that you have prepared what kind of shape and size it has, so that you can get very quick information using this scanning electron microscopy. So how this uh, basically works, what is the basic principle of this? Uh, have you used a scanning electron microscope for your experiment? You have used. Okay. So basically this uh, equipment uh, you have to uh, keep your sample in the vacuum, uh, it is a very important because it is investigated using an electron beam. So the essential component of uh, this tool is uh, electron source and then we have some lenses, this is not optical lenses, these are electromagnetic lenses to focus your electron beam and then the sample stage is there and then there is a detector which basically detect the back scattered electron or the secondary electrons. So that is how, how it is done. So basically uh, this is a schematic shown here. Uh, so uh, the electrons are generated here and then there is these are the lenses which basically uh, focuses the electron beam and then this is a scanning coil which basically causes this, uh, this beam to move and fall at different point of the sample and sample is here. When the electron beam falls here, then couple of things takes pl place here and in uh, this secondary electrons are generated, back scattered electrons are generated and these electrons are picked up to construct the image of this surface. And not only this, the x-rays are also generated with the electron fall on it and these x-rays are used for uh, finding out what kind of elements are present in this material. So in one go you can get all this information provided you have this kind of detector. So basically what happens that when the electron beam uh, falls on this uh, specimen and the electron gets collided, couple of things could happen. One thing could be that these electrons just come here and they uh, uh, just scattered back. So this we call as back scattered electron. The second thing could be that uh, uh, these electrons go and what they do in the atom, they knock out some electrons. Okay, when they knock out this electron, these electrons comes out and we call this as secondary electrons. The other thing could be happen what we call as OJ electrons. See in OJ electrons what happens when the, the electron has gone up uh, in this uh, orbit and the place has got vacant and on that place the next electrons comes down and it emits light. Okay. So that is what we call as uh, uh, X-ray characteristic X-rays. This is used in XPS for characterization or uh, the next thing could happen that light which is coming out gives energy to another electron and that electron comes out. So that what we call as OJ electron. So all these things are there are different tools have been developed which basically detect these different electrons, reflected electrons and they are based on this one. So your SEM basically see this uh, back scattered electron and the secondary electrons. And for this elemental characterization, they use basically the OJ electrons. Okay, uh, no, sorry, this characteristic X-ray they use. And this uh, the, there is another tool what we call as transmission electron microscopy. They use basically those electron which has transmitted through it. So I am not discussing this tool here. Mostly for the scanning electron microscopy is the back scattered electron and this secondary electrons are used. So this again the same picture I have shown here, the electron comes here and then basically it can give uh, the X-ray photon or it can uh, uh, scatter the electron, back scattered electron and can also uh, it can give the secondary electron. So this is all possible. 
Now I will just quickly go and show you some of the pictures of this SEM. Uh, rest of if you have any curiosity or more we can discuss tomorrow. Uh, so, so what happens the electrons are generated in the SEM using this tungsten filaments and this is one of the very crucial part here and if it get broken then nothing could comes out. So, uh, and uh, with uh, due course of time uh, this get deteriorated so finally it breaks so we have to change it so we keep on doing that after certain cycle we need to change this. Thing. So, this is the photograph of uh, the uh, tungsten filament shown here and uh, it is heated so electrons comes out and then these anodes are used which basically focuses these electron. Uh, this is a walnut cover is shown here. So, tomorrow when you will see this uh, equipment you will see this part uh, in more detail. And this is the a typical uh, surface image of uh, the material and you can get lot of information from this image. Otherwise, it will look like a any kind of things right. So, there you require a more practice and uh, because uh, doing this experiment also requires is a, is a science, but also a art because uh, you should have a feeling when you can get a good image of this thing. So, typically I mean it is understood that if you keep on increasing the voltage you will get a good image, but sometime it does not happen because increasing of voltage also start doing many charging effect and all that. So, uh, it is not good. For example, a picture is shown here uh, at 5 kilo volt I am getting some very good image right and uh, it is it is thought that if I increase the voltage electron will get more energy they will penetrate into the material more and more secondary electron will come out and then our image will be better ok. So, in principle theoretically it looks fine because if you have more secondary electron or more back scattered electron then obviously image will be better. But what happens when we uh, increase the voltage to from 5 kilo volt to 15 kilo volt then all these distorted image coming started coming out no, no gain. Why it happens this is what we call as charging effect because the whatever the secondary electrons which are generated we need to remove also. If we do not remove what will happen uh, the they will start doing a rippling effect of the coming electron. So, that is how the charging effect takes place. So, so these things cannot be theoretically written there is no thumb rule for this only when we do the experiment we know what kind of voltage or current we should put. Similarly, uh, for this uh, probe current also we have to optimize a number so that we can good get a good image. So, these things we know only when we do the experiments and do it more precisely uh, treating the equipment as a kind of very uh, important and soft tool we handle with care and uh, do the conversation with the experiment and equipment also then only we can do uh, perform better way. So, these are the some of the pictures are again shown here and they are taken at a different one this is the optical image and this is the image of uh, this SEM obviously you can go get much more detail in the SEM image and all that kind of thing ok. All right now I will just uh, quickly uh, tell you about this uh, ADAX thing. Uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy which is again very important thing because you want to know that if you are making any uh, material uh, if some impurity is there what impurity is there. So, you can really identify what impurity is there. I was just making a question that you are making zirconium oxide you are getting some extra peak you do not know what material what material could, could be. So, the best thing is that I was saying that you go and check uh, the level this thing this can be one way the other way is that you do this uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy. Then you can know that apart from zirconium and oxygen what other things are present. If tin is present copper is present then obviously, the possible impurity could be copper oxide or tin oxide. So, your job becomes simple and you can really identify it a more pure material or get rid of this in the process which you are using for preparing this material. So, this one is uh, basically based on as I was telling from this uh, x-ray which is coming out from the material and in the process same the unit is same the only the difference here is the detector part is, is a bit different. So, these are the photographs of uh, the SEM and how you place the samples and all that kind of thing. So, uh, if you if you if you if you do are doing ADS obviously slightly more distance you have to keep 
and if you are doing SEM you can go even nearer to this, these are more practical things when you do the experiment then you will know it. So, so these are again the photographs, uh, this is the place where we place our uh, stage, where we place our sample and after placing the sample uh, this uh, is closed and then we uh, put on the pump and when the vacuum is created only then the gun is on and we start taking the picture. So, this is how we do that and here are some pictures are shown here, some the I think nano wire or nano flowers are there and you can also find out if you, if you make some films and you want to know a thickness of the film, you can uh, upload your sample like this vertically and then from seeing the top you can see uh, uh, how the surface interface between these two looks like. So, these kind of things are you can find out here are some of the pictures of uh, the uh, of different nano materials. For example, uh, these are the I think zinc oxide nano, riot, nano rods, nano flowers and all that kind of images there. So, you can see the uh, morphology and if you have uh, this facility also the element analysis also, you can also see that how the elements are distributed over the morphology. So, what you have to see that you have to take the image of uh, the, uh, the elemental image at different points and then you can develop a topography. So, uh, this is my last slide uh, where I try to show you that it is a zinc oxide material which is a nano flower which I think we took uh, the, uh, from the research work of one of my PhD students. So, here uh, we can scan the zinc, we can scan the oxygen and then we can overlap these two then I can know that how the zinc and oxygens are distributed in the material and it is a very uniform. For example, this picture you see uh, this is uh, this is for oxygen and this is for zinc and the same this is a SEM image, this is for the elemental image how the zinc is distributed, this is how the oxygen is distributed. I overlap these two I can construct this thing and this really tells that at what way the zinc and oxygens are distributed inside the material. So, that gives a pretty good idea about the uniformity and all that kind of stuff.